Well, praise the Lord. Welcome to an hour of power here at Pathway to Peace Ministries. We're excited to be with you here today at Pathway to Peace. And we just pray that the Lord will bless you in a mighty, mighty, powerful way. It's good to uh, come together and learn and from the word of God and uh, the purpose of God, the mission of God and our mission in these last days. So again, we want to welcome you to Pathway to Peace, our power. I pray that you receive the power that you're looking for, and that's only from Jesus Christ. All power is given in his hand. Um, he has all power in heaven and earth and the sea all over. Uh, he is the master. He is our master of the whole entire planet and the universe. So the Bible reveals that Jesus is coming again. The question is, are you ready? Am I ready? And let's pray that we're all ready. Uh, the final events will be very rapid. And we see those things are happening as we speak. But today we're going to be looking at the impartable sin. We're going to finish. Get, we're going to finish uh, the lesson on the impartable sin. And this lesson, of course, is the conclusion of that. And I pray that it will be a blessing so we can understand what is the impartable sin? We already looked at the uh, blasphemy or the sin against the Holy Spirit, the continual rejection of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, we're going to continue that study and finish it up today. But before we do that, we're going to go into prayer. We're going to have prayer. And uh, remember, of course, the projects is going on here. Uh, we have a new uh, second edition of the evidence on Online now, I just pray that you could. It has a link to the a link. I didn't put. I don't think I put the download for that. At, anyway, I have have the link. We'll have soon have a new download for it too. But I have a link to the uh, Barnes and Nobles if you want the um, hard copy. And I encourage you to get the hard copy. Was that? Oh, the paper paperback. But soon be uh, hard. Yeah, soon it will be the hard uh, cover. But uh, she's going to give me a copy of it so I can show it to everybody. But again, this is a, a study reference that, that you need to have in your library. It's called, it's the hardback. This will soon be available. Uh, the hardback copy. You hear that? The hardback copy. And again, one of the main missions of Pathway to Peace is to give tools in your hands so you can not only study and understand the word for yourself, but you'll be able to share it with others. So here's another tool right here. Don't take advantage of these things. I mean, it's right in your hand. I mean, this is it. Instead of spending money on some ice cream comb or whatever, we should, you know, uh, some uh, some junk at the uh, some other place. Here's some wholesome, a book, because knowledge, the evidence, biblical chart of time from the beginning to the end. But this is a great project going on right now. But this is the hardback copy. It'll be available soon on Barnes and Noble. The softback is already available on Barnes and Noble. Just go to our website and you'll get that. And uh, it's beautiful. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. And as you can see here, the chart as it charts through time. Uh, the various things that we have on there that charge, literally charge through time, going through all the kings, the kings of Ju going through the whole Bible. But I mean, that's part of it, of the time. And it has a lot of the charts and the maps and things like that. You want this book. Go ahead and just get it. All right. Just get it. And we do have soon, I forgot, and going with this project, we have a brochure to go with the project to is a quick read. It's like quick. But I mean, but you want the whole thing. But it's a quick read just to get people to whet their appetite, to get them to go to the book. But uh, anyway. And of course, the forgotten commandment, we still have some forgotten commandments left. I don't have any more boxes, though full boxes because we we're all sold out of those but we do have some uh some single books 
uh, the Forgotten Commandment. I'll have it up here, but uh, the Forgotten Commandment, Mark of His Crisis book. It is time to get that book out to your family or friends. It's high time. I mean, it's past time. Um, because you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to wait till the crisis comes and then give it out. You want to wait before you want to do it before the crisis. So we again, we're praying that you that you uh, get that book to your family or friends, and they can go download it, uh, get it for free, uh, pay a cent. It goes right to the, they can get it right on the iPhone, on the Android, on their computer, um, and they can download download that for free. So just let them know exactly where to get it to study the um, three angels message and the market of crisis so they can be ready, prepared so and be converted to God's truth in this last day. So that's what we have so far. There's many other things. Uh, you probably see we got a little painting project here too um, that we have to finish up. But because uh, you probably see that behind the on the uh, on the screen there but um anyway there it is that's our little report right before prayer so we remember you in prayer requests we know there are many of have prayer requests especially at this time that we're living in especially for their young ones or loved ones as I just say who have not made a decision to follow christ all the way and you're continually praying for them and um and we're just praying for a path of the peace. We're praying for uh, that we're all ready when the Lord returns. But at this time, let us go into prayer. And then after prayer, we'll have our Bible study. And then after Bible study, we have our prophetic updates. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you so much again for your word. We thank you for your Bible. We thank you for the days and times that we live in. Even though we know we're living at the end of time, we know that you're in control of everything. We just pray that we place our faith in you and keep our faith in you. And may we endure to the end. Lord, not by might nor by power, but only by your spirit that we are empowered to do your will. And we just pray, Lord, that we would uh, be holy, be uh, perfect before the father at this time. There is search our hearts, O Lord, to see if there be any wicked way in us. Cleanse us, make us whole. We pray, Lord, that there's no wickedness, no covetousness, no sin in us whatsoever. No, no, uh, no lust, no worldliness at all, Lord. But may we have the spirit of God from the head to toe. In our heart, the love of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for salvation. We thank you, Lord, for your everlasting covenant. We continue to pray, Lord, for the projects here, the evidence book and the uh, Market of Beach Crisis and other projects we have going on here, the uh, Bible tracks. And we just pray, Lord, that people are, use these tools to to minister to others in these last days. May we not uh, pa- bypass these wonderful tools that the Lord has given us to share your word, and especially the evidence book to show us where we are in the stream of time, to show us how old the earth is, to show that you have given us an everlasting covenant from the beginning and to the end and that your coming is very soon and we must be ready. Um, it's, it's evident that you are, it's, it reveals the evidence of your word, reveals the evidence of the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ and the everlasting covenant. So we just pray, Lord, is used as a blessing for others. We pray that for the many Bible tracts that have gone out, the forgotten commandment that going out. We pray, Lord, that people read and study and be converted to your truth. Uh, we know that Satan is working hard to uh, to keep people from your truth. But our Lord, we just pray that your truth go out. We know it will because you said it, it will. And we know that the mark of the beast crisis is soon to come. And we pray that we're ready. And of course, we pray that we're ready for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, again for this time that we study together. We continue to study the mark, the um, unpardonable sin. And may we not commit the unpardonable sin. May we listen to your word and your Holy Spirit minister to us. And may we be obedient to you. We pray. Give us understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
All right, let's go ahead and go into it. Here, Caroline, you can go ahead and take this. We are studying the uh, lesson number 28. You can go down and download it. The uh, Bible study, lesson number 28, The Unpardonable Sin. And uh, we looked at the study of the um, uh, lesson number 28. We looked at Jesus offers salvation to everyone, and uh, he wants everyone to repent and turn from sin. But the Bible makes it very clear that, that the blasphemy or the sin against the Holy Spirit is an unpardonable sin because the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of sin. If we, if we um, reject continually the convictor of sin, there's impossible to be saved. And that's why it's known as an impardonable sin, because there's no way to be pardoned without the Holy Spirit convicting us sin and pointing us to the sin cleaner, Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit has a a a marvelous role in our salvation and has to lead us to Jesus Christ to convict us of sin. So we want to make sure that we are not hardened by the invitation of mercy that the Holy Spirit is giving us. In this last days. So the more we reject the truth of God, the more we reject the Holy Spirit. And as over time, our hearts would get hard if we continually reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, one thing is, if you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you know you have not committed the impartable sin. If you hear God's voice speaking to you, you know you have not committed the impartable sin. But normally, a person that commits the impartable sin takes no uh, makes no um, makes no words or uh, has no conviction of the truth makes no profession of the of uh, conversion I guess some will make a profession and still be in in sin um yeah, that, that can happen. But the main thing is rejection of God's truth. Continue rejection and no love for the truth. Um, but let's go ahead and continue on with this study and understanding the unpardonable sin. Like I said, if you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you have not committed an unpardonable sin. But normally a person that has committed an unpardonable sin, they they are living life uh, unconscious of the call of the Holy Spirit and uh, and it's truth. Even when some may be Christians, don't you know, a Christian can commit the impartable sin when God's revealing the truth from the word of God and they continually reject that truth. Um, and that's why it's very dangerous as God reveals his truth to even those who profess to be Christians like they continue to reject the truth of the Sabbath or reject the truth of a victory over sin uh, through Jesus Christ, and then they have no consciousness or conviction of following that truth. That's a dangerous thing, because when truth comes your way, that's the Holy Spirit pricking the heart. And so that's the reason why we don't want to harden our hearts against the Holy Spirit and his call for the truth to our minds, to our conscious mind. Now, let's go ahead and again, we're in lesson number 28. We're looking at the impartable sin and we're on question number 12. Like I mentioned before, we're going to go ahead and close this on out, this study on out for um, this, this hour of power. So let's go ahead and do that. As a result of continuing to put off the conviction and rejecting the truth, what can happen? Well, we see some examples here of King, the King, King Saul. Let's go to 1 Samuel 11, 1 Samuel 10, 9 through 11, because he was a good king at one time, and then he got the big head. You know, nobody can handle a bunch of praise. Only God can handle it, and uh, we see what happened. Let's go, go ahead and see. 1 Samuel 10, 9 through 11, and it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart 
And all these signs came to pass that day. And when they came hither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said to one another, what is it? It's come from the son of Kish. It saw also among the prophets. So at this present time, um, when Saul becomes king, he prophesies. And um, the spirit of God came upon him just to show that at one time, King Saul had a connection with the Holy Spirit and spoke under conviction of the Holy Spirit. And this will show you if a person's in the Holy Spirit, but they over time, sadly, get the big head like Saul and then reject the Holy Spirit. He can commit a sin, the impartable sin against the Holy Spirit. We see that with the King Saul. Let's continue on. First Samuel. Now let's go to first Samuel 11, verse six. Let's listen some more to the story of King Saul and the spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those things and his anger was kindled greatly. So we see again another when he defeated the Ammonites, the Holy Spirit came upon King Saul and they were able to defeat the Ammonites. As a result, the Holy Spirit moving upon Saul, they gave him power to overcome the enemy. Let's go to now. Let's continue on. First Samuel 13, 7 through 14, just showing you the Holy Spirit was with King Saul at one time. But sadly, over time, because of his continued rejecting of the truth and obedience, to God's word, he committed the impartable sin. Let's go to first Samuel 13, 7 through 14. First Samuel 13, 7 through 14. And the Bible says, and some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal and all the people follow him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time of Samuel he appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, bring hither the burnt offering to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, one thing you understand here, Saul has now lost his patience. It's a very dangerous thing to do because Saul, in order to stay in communion with God, he was he was supposed to be obedient to to the commands of God. And one of the main things that Saul was about to do, what he was what he did was he performed the the uh, the ceremony that was only for the priests. Them care if Saul was a king. King Saul, he was not a priest. And King and Samuel, Samuel was the priest, and he was performing the ceremony, but Saul cannot wait. He got impatient. And um, let's continue on. And so verse. Verse nine, let's go to look at verse nine. And Saul said, bring hither the burnt offering to me and the peace offering he offered. And he offered the burnt offering. Sad, sad, sad. Because what he do did, he disobeyed the will and command of God. And it came to pass as soon as he had made end of the offering of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what has I done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me and that thou hast come not within the days appointed and that the Philistine gathered themselves together at McMish. Therefore, I said unto the Philistines, therefore, I, I said, the Philistines will come now upon me at Kegal and I cannot not and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself to dis- <laughs> I forced myself, therefore, to offer the burnt offering. Now, he knew he was doing wrong. And now he says he did what? He forced himself. Now he's lying. He didn't force himself. He was just, he was impatient. And so you see Saul now going down this road of, of uh, 
perdition. Let's continue on because he's actually did he may take any blame at all. He took no blame. He blamed Samuel for just being slow. I mean, that's basically saying that you weren't here, man. And I had to go ahead and perform it because you weren't here now. But he did not recognize that he actually did wrong. He said, man, I'm sorry. He didn't say I'm sorry for doing wrong. I know this is for the priest. Lord, forgive me. None of that. Let's continue on. And Samuel said, verse 13, and Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done what? Foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which has commanded thee for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom, uh, Israel, forever? But now, verse 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord have commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou has not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So in other words, what Samuel's relaying to Saul, that Saul continually broke the, com- the covenant that God had with Saul. And as the Holy Spirit convicted Saul, because Saul was convicted here, you can see even in, in his uh, dissertation to Samuel, he's convicted here, but that what does he do? He puts away the conviction and then tries to um, make excuses and try to make himself look right and make Samuel look wrong as a but. One thing we know about God and his word, he never changes and we cannot make an excuse. So what happens over time? Because Samuel continues. I mean, Saul, rather Saul continues in his rebellion against God, because here again, after he rebuke, he does not turn from sin. And God saw the heart of Saul. Now, let's go to Samuel 15, one through three. And then we're going to look at verse nine through 28. Let's continue in this in this this story here of what happened to Saul, the first king of Israel. And how long did he reign, by the way? How long was his was his? It was very short. It's only two years, only two years. That's it. Whew, he got fired. All right. First Samuel 15. And why was he fired? Because he was not listening. First Samuel 15, one through three, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. And then it continues on. Verse two, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. Now he laid wait for him in the way when he came to the camp of Egypt. Now go and smite, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy. What's the word say? Utterly destroy all that I, that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and women, infant and suckling ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, do you all understand what God's telling him to do? He said, destroy, utterly destroy everything. Now, so did Sam, did Saul follow what he's supposed to do? He's being tested again. Matter of fact, as you can see here, God has given Saul another chance. But as you see, as we go on, you see that the Saul had no love for the truth, no love for following the commands of God. You can see him continually reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we see what happens in the end. We can't take lightly in the commands of God and disobeying his commands. Let's go ahead and look at verse nine. Look at verse nine and through twenty eight. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best sheep. Now, let's talk about after the battle, after the battle. Now, what did God tell him to do? Just utterly destroy. But notice what he's doing. Agag, Agag, the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings of the lamb and all that was good and would and would not utterly destroy them. But everything 
that was vile and refused, they destroy utterly. So everything they ain't want and they ain't like, they went ahead and destroyed it. But the stuff they like, it's like, man, we can use that. Now, what did God say? Destroy it all. But they didn't do what God say do. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, verse 11, this is God's song. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned his back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to met Saul in the morning, it was told to Samuel, saying, Saul came to the car- came to Carmel. And behold, he set up a place is gone about and passed on and go down to Gigal. And Samuel came to Saul. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. And I perform the commandment of the Lord. Now, Saul is going to come up here and straight up lie. I mean, he's talking about he did what? I, I did what you told me to do. I did what, exactly what the Lord told me to do. Now, let's see what the Bible says. Let's continue on. Did Samuel fall for that lie? Because God told Samuel exactly what Saul did. And that's why it's, it's kind of hard to lie to a prophet but anyway, or God. Verse 14. And Samuel saw what meant, meaneth, meaneth, then the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the ox in my that I hear. So Saul, 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 wait a minute. You said you obeyed the command of God. But why do we why do we hear this? The sheep bad, bad. Uh, what's what's going on with that? That's not what God command. So now what Samuel, what God is giving Saul an opp- another opportunity to repent. But we see that Saul's heart at this time. Remember, he's all puffed up because he think he, you know, he's all that because he's king of Israel. And so now we see because, you know, we get to the point of pride and puffed up. Many times you feel those who feel who, who are in that feel they have the the uh, excuse of being disobedient to God's word. Verse 15. And Saul said, I have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So, but what did God tell him to do? Destroy all of them, the ox and the sheep. But that's not what Saul did. Verse 16, then Samuel said unto Saul, stay and I will tell thee. What the Lord hath said unto me this night. And he said unto him, say on. And Samuel said, when thou was little. In thine own sight. And was made and was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Therefore. Then dost thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil and this evil upon the sight of the Lord. And Samuel said unto and Saul said unto Samuel, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Oh, come on now. He's telling him he's disobedient. And, and, and then Saul is basically saying, Samuel, you're lying. See, that's when you know that somebody is rejected the truth especially the prophet is trying to tell reveal to him the truth and God's will but Saul said unto Samuel yea I have obeyed the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Ahag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites verse 21 but the people took of the spoil the sheep of ox and the chief of things and the chief other things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice it to the Lord thy God in Gagal. Now, who is he putting now? He's putting the blame on somebody totally different. When the blame was on who? Saul. Because God ultimately, ultimately gave Saul the responsibility because Saul was a king. And then let's continue on. Verse 22. And Samuel said, hath the Lord 
as a great delight in burning burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is the better than sacrifice and to hearken to, and to hearken to the fat of the rams. Because, you know, he was, Saul was saying, oh, these things are for sacrifice. Now, it's not a sacrifice if you are getting it in spoil. I mean, you're getting from, from the people that you uh, have taken in victory over in war. That's not a sacrifice. It's not of your own. Plus, God said, destroy them anyway. And so verse 40, 23, for rebellion is at the, as a sin of what? Witchcraft. That's a serious thing. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, the stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath rejected thee from being king. So you see clearly why Saul was rejected as being king. This disobedient to God's truth, explicit will. So he cannot be not lead the people in the right way. And see, then Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Now he says, as God has now rejected Saul. And that's what the Bible says in verse 23. Now Saul says what? Because now he realized he's going to lose his kingdom. He's going to lose his kingship. He's going to lose his position. In other words, Saul, you're fired. You're fired. I mean, and, and, and that's basically what God's telling Saul because of his disobedience. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, I have tra- for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people, obeyed their voice. So now he's using that game. He's trying to play that game and say, okay, it's not my fault, really, because the people. I just fear the people. So he still, he wasn't repentant. Because at this point, he, she, he should have repented of his sins. And now, therefore, I pray, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship thee, the Lord. So God knows the heart and he knows that Saul is not asking for true repentance. He's not asking for a heartfelt repentance. In verse 26, because now he's getting the he 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 does, he, he he's saying these things that he repents because he don't want to lose a position. Because he's about to lose his position. He's about to be lose his throne. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away. He laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and rent and it rent. And Samuel said unto him. The Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel. From thee this day and has given to the neighbor of thine that is better than thou. So remember, Saul looked like a king. I mean, he was not tall, strong. He looked like a king. And uh, but when at the beginning, he was very humble. But over time, the people puffed up his head and he believed that as king, he can do whatever he wants. But he forgot. And he rejected the will of God. So what happened as as a result of this to show that he rejected the Holy Spirit? Let's go to first Samuel because he was never really truly repentant. First Samuel 16 verse 14 and 16. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. You see that? Now we've read earlier in the first part of his life as king because he's only king for two years. The spirit of the Lord was with him. But as we continue to, re- to reject God's will, the spirit of the Lord withdrew from him. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and the evil spirit of the Lord troubled him. And Saul servant saw him and behold, an evil spirit from God troubled thee. And of course, that evil spirit wasn't from the God itself, but it's just revealing that uh, Saul had an evil spirit. In which God pulled back because Saul continually reject the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, let our let our Lord now command thee, thy servants, which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning to play. A cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from the Lord from God is come upon thee and he shall play with his hand. And it shall be well. And that's a problem that Saul had. He 
he had a problem because as the spirit of the Lord withdrew from Saul, he got depressed easily. And he needed music to kind of comfort him. And that's what David came in. David was a master harper. And David played the harp to kind of to kind of ease the mood of Saul. But the reason why Saul was so 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 upset and angry most all the time is because he continually rejected the Holy Spirit. And it just shows you again, the disobedience of God's word is not freedom. The disobedience of God's word is re- is is bondage and bondage to, in this case, the despondency and depression. And we find that here in Saul. Let's go to verse. So he needed music to help soothe his his uh, his soul. Verse 23. First Samuel, verse 16, verse 23. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul. David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So we see again the evil spirit. We know this evil spirit was a demonic spirit, was upon Saul. And the Lord, what is the reason why it's saying it came from the Lord? Because the Lord pulled back his hand. The Lord allowed Saul to be totally possessed because Saul rejected the truth. Let's go to. First uh, Samuel eighteen five through twelve. We we'll continue the story, the sad story of Saul's rejection of truth. Let's see. First Samuel eighteen five through twelve, and David went out whithersoever Saul sent him. And behaved him wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people. And also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as it came. David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines. And the woman came out of all the cities singing and dancing. And met King Saul with tamarinds, with joy. And with instruments of music. And the woman answered one another. And they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his ten thousands. Now, what do you think Saul felt about that? His pride was, was, uh, was, was vandalized <laughs> by these words of these women when David came back killing more in the battle than did Saul. So Saul was very wroth, verse 8. And the saying displeased him. And he said, I have ascribed unto David 10,000. And to me that they have ascribed, but thousands. What can ye have more but the kingdom? And Saul I David from that day forward. So we see Saul was extremely jealous of David. And verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow, the evil spirit from the God came upon Saul. And he prophesied in the midst of the house and David played with his hand and the other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand and Saul cast a javelin for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So we see here that the spirit of God is not with Saul, that the demonic spirit is on Saul And Saul continually rejected the Holy Spirit. And we see here that Saul is in a in a in a position, sadly, in which he has committed the impartable sin. Because we see that as we continue to study. And Saul was afraid of David. And because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Let's go to first Samuel 19, 9 and 10. First Samuel 19, 9 and 10. And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall with a javelin, but he slipped away and Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. So again, we see that Saul was extremely uh, jealous and hated David. 
And we see again the spirit of the Lord left Saul because we find that in verse nine and the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with a javelin in the hand and David played in his hand. Now let's go to uh, first Chronicles and uh, look at the conclusion of Saul's life. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse one through four. First Chronicles. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, then 13 and 14. First Chronicles, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Let's listen. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from the Philistines and fell down and slain in the Mount Gilboa. Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul. And after his sons and the Philistines slew Jonathan. Abinadab. And Mel. Melshai. And the sons of Saul. And the battle went sore against Saul and the archers hit him. And he was wounded of the archers. And then said to his armor bearer, draw thy sword and thrust me through wherewith. Lest the uncircumcised come and abuse me. But this armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. So, so Saul took the sword and fell upon it. So sadly, Saul killed himself. It's a sad end to a promising life. And even before that, we saw, and I, I didn't have it in these texts here, that Saul spoke to the witch after Samuel died. The witch of Endor. Where at one time he was killing witches. He was, he was putting away the witches as God revealed in his word to do. But then he began to speak to the witch. And the witch of Endor. Uh, spiritualism. And now he killed himself. Verse 13. So Saul died for his transgressions. So the Bible reveals that he died what? In his transgressions. So when it comes to this, to the judgment of the Lord, we see that Saul is lost because he rejected his main problem as he continually rejected the Holy Spirit. So Saul died of for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord, against the word of the Lord, which he kept not also asking counsel of one that had familiar spirits to inquire of it and inquire not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom of turn the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. So that's a sad end to a promising life. Why is a sad end? His main reason was he continually re rejected the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John 13. Verse 21 through 30. John 13. Verse 21 through 30. The Bible says. When Jesus has said thus, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in the spirit and testified. And barely, verily, I shall say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked upon one another, downing whom he spake. Now, who are we talking about? Of course, Judas betraying Jesus. Now there was leaning upon Jesus the bosom of one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. And Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask, who is it should be whom that he spake? He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he who, whom that I shall give sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus said unto him, thou doest quickly. Continuing. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake unto the him. But some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him by those things that we need 
that we have need against the feast need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. He then having received the sop went out immediately and it was night. So we see when you look at the story of sadly, when you look at the story of Judas, Judas also was an example of one that committed the impartable sin. So not only did we see Saul kill himself, what did Judas do to himself? What happened to Judas in the end after he betrayed Christ? He did the same. He killed himself. But you notice that Judas recognized that he he um, that he um, betrayed an innocent man. But in his confession, it wasn't a true repentant confession. He uh, still killed himself. So he was not converted because the Holy Spirit, he he no longer felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we see Judas himself had committed the impartable sin. When God was pleading with him, Jesus was pleading with Judas. Judas did not respond to the plea. All right. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Let's go to let's go to uh, question number 13. The last question on the impartable sin. So I hope you see an example of Saul, an example of Judas, of two individuals in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament that committed the impartable sin. And it's sadly at the end that they both commit, killed themselves. What warning does the Bible give us when the Holy Spirit speaks to us concerning the things we learn from God and his word? And that's I mean, that's why it's really important that those who continually reject the Holy Spirit will eventually commit the impartable sin. Let's go to Hebrews three, seven and eight. And as we can see, we, we cannot make excuses in the rejection of God's truth. The more we reject the Holy Spirit, the more we we, uh, we will not hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Hebrews 3, 7 and 8. Hebrews 3, 7 and 8. Wherefore, as the Holy, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said today, if thou will hear his voice, what the Bible say? Harden not your hearts as in the provocation as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. So that's what God reveals. That's what God is saying to all of us to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Harden not your heart. Let's go to Hebrews chapter four, verse one. One through seven. The Bible says here, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come and short of it for unto us was a gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it for we which have believe do enter into rest as he said as I have sworn unto my wrath if any shall enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world verse 4 for he spake of a certain place of the seventh day on his wise and God did rest the seventh day from all his works and in his place again if they shall enter into my rest. Continue on verse six. Seeing therefore it remained that some must enter therein and they whom it was first preached enter not. in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day saying to David today. After so long a time, as it is said today, if we will hear his voice. Does the Bible say hard, not your heart. So there are people who have not entered the rest, the spiritual rest of the Holy of God, of Jesus Christ. But what the Bible reveals in verse four, he's talking about not only just the spiritual rest, but the physical rest of the rest, the seventh day Sabbath rest. And there are many who do not do not 
uh, enter into that rest, as the Bible reveals here, does not enter into the Sabbath rest, is because of verse 6, unbelief. And sadly, all those who receive the mark of the beast, those who reject the Sabbath, seven-day Sabbath, will eventually commit the impardonable sin. All those who receive the mark of the beast have committed the impardonable sin. It's a bad situation to be in. Let's go to James 4.17. That's the reason why we should hear the voice of God and not harden ourselves to the truth of God's word as it reveals. Because anyone who rejects the word continually are setting themselves up to commit the impartable sin. Let's go to James 4, 17. James 4, 17. What's the Bible say? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And that individual who continually does that will commit the impartable sin. Let's go to John 13, 7. John 13, verse 17. That'll be our last text of the day. John 13. That's a lot of text. That's good, though. John 13, verse 17. So after he had washed their feet and had taken their garments and was set down again, he said unto him, Know ye what I have done to you. Verse 17. That was verse 13. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. That's beautiful. And that's what Jesus is saying. If we're just obedient to God's word, doing exactly what he says, we will be happy and we will have rest. But if we see those who reject God's word, their end is disaster. We saw that example of Saul. We saw that example of Judas. And we see that an example of those who continually reject God's word, and especially when it comes to the seventh day Sabbath. The Bible's revealing that they will eventually um, reject the Holy Spirit. So the impartable sin is at a point is when a person rejects the Holy Spirit and then no longer can feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit because they continually reject the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why, as God gives us his truth, We need to make sure we're going to follow and surrender to his truth in the last days. Because the reality is, as true servants of God, we must be servants of God that has surrendered ourselves to God and uh, for the service of God and keep the commandments of God. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that we not commit the impartable sin, that we not blaspheme the name of the Holy Spirit, and that we just stay faithful to your word. Though the heavens fall, Lord, may we endure to the end, not by might nor by power. Give us your spirit, Lord. And as your word says, if, that we, may we not harden our heart, because we know that those who have hardened their heart against the Holy Spirit, have committed the impartable sin. So, Lord, may we not commit the impartable sin. May we follow the explicit will of God. We saw the examples of Saul. We saw the examples of Judas and how they did not follow the explicit will of God and how they were seduced away and and followed the, the temptations and yielded to the temptations of Satan. And we saw that instead of having the spirit of God, they had the spirit of Satan. So, Lord, help us to have the right spirit. Be with us as we continue to, uh, in the hour of powers, we look at the prophetic updates that reveal that we are at the end of time. So be with us and may we be ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So at this time, we're going to have our prophetic updates by Sister Rogers as we close out for our hour of power. So, Go ahead and let's listen and find out where we are in the stream of time and that we time is short. And I pray that you have been studying God's word and um, and sharing it with others.
Okay, so, um, for today's prophetic update, it's um, something that I'm actually looking at and I'm uh, beginning to study, and I thought I'd just highlight what I have so far, but as I said, it's uh, when I'm continuing to study, it's a document uh, that I saw as I was looking at something, and um, the reason why this document is important is because if you remember in Revelation 13, that's Revelation 13, wherein it talks about the mark of the beast crisis in verse 17. It says, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So in order to be have a system where someone is unable to buy or sell, there has to be some system in place. So that's why this actually caught my attention as I saw what I'm going to share with you today. And um, it's uh, something that I'm still looking at. Uh, so let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please continue to teach us as we continue to study and learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, and just briefly, this is um, a document that came out um, from the worldbank.org. Um, and you see the um, where the website is at the top. And it says the World Bank Group, and this is a practitioner's guide, and it came out in June of 2019. So it's a new guide and it's still going out. And so I saw someone who had their information and I wanted to find out a little bit about, more about who they are, what they do specifically by going through the um, practitioner's guide. So let's take a look at some of the stuff the uh, information that's provided there. First of all, this is just something I wanted to know myself. Who's the World Bank? I didn't, I wasn't as familiar with them. Um, but um, so I went to their site to find out who they were. And this is what they say, who we are with 189 member countries. So that's a lot. They're, they're, they're telling you it's a world um, organization. Staff from more than 170 countries and offices in over 130 locations. The World Bank Group is a unique global partnership. Five institutions working for sustainable solutions that reduce poverty and build shared prosperity in developing country. And again, it says at the bottom, their mission is to end extreme poverty and to promote shared prosperity. That's the next slide. Okay, so that's who they are. So inside the document of, of this ID, uh, ID4D, basically it's a worldwide informational well, I'll, I'll let it kind of just tell you. I'm still looking at this. I I don't know that much. Um, it's over 200 pages, and um, it's pretty detailed. Uh, so, but this is just some things that I've gathered so far, and it's is very brief because I'm like I said, I'm still looking at it. Um, it says Good ID supports multiple development goals. So, why does the identity gap ID matter? It talks about that ID systems are crucial tools for achieving sustainable development, including the World Bank's goal uh, group's twin goal of ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. For this reason, ensuring that Who's that? Who's that that they're talking about? <laughs> everyone. So this is a World Bank, and they're saying they want to ensure that everyone has access to identification is the explicit objective of the Sustainable Development Goal target. And again, that's the target that's, you know, the United Nations has the, the Sustainable uh, Development Goals to provide legal identity for all, including birth registration, it says by 2030. Furthermore, identification is also a key or partial enabler of progress towards many other Sustainable Development Goal targets, such as financial and economic inclusion. So that got my attention as I read that. Um, social protection, health care, and education for all. Um, go to the next one. Um, it says ID systems, this is on page 11. It says ID systems collect and validate identity attributes in order to establish a person's identity and provide proof of that identity in the form of credentials, unique ID number, card, certificate, um, these credentials can be used by the person through some method of authentication to assert or prove their identity to relying parties, example, government agencies, financial institutions, employers, etc. 
that requires some assurance of who you are. The, the basic roles of an ID system, because this is what they are setting up. This is not just on a national level either. It's a, it's a world bank. It's, you know, world um, system um, that they want the information for, from what I understand. It says the, the basic roles, if you look at part one, is to establish who you are, identification. And, and again, that's, that's understandable. Establishing and determining a person's identity by collecting and proofing relative, uh, relevant identity information. Number two, it says checking that a person who asserts or claims identity is the true owner of that identity based on how uh, one or more factors that they have, know or are. And then three, the authorization. Now that's in red there, and I thought this part was the most interesting one. It says checking specific attributes necessary to determine whether a person is authorized or eligible for something. So they use this system to determine, well, does this person eligible for something? Um, verification of an attribute required for a specific purpose, example, age, nationality, income. Foundational ID systems can verify, um, however, maintaining uh, purpose-specific data and making authorization decisions is typically the purpose of functional ID systems. And this is a functional ID system that they are developing. And the purpose is not just to identify who you are, but as you see, this functional ID system is also to determine if you're eligible for something. And they had mentioned earlier, as it said, um, go back to the previous ones, they're looking at um, financial and economic inclusion. So if you, anyway, um, like it's, I said earlier, I am still looking at this. And the reason why I'm looking at this is because in order for you to not be able to buy or sell, there has to be some system in place. And this, um, is something that is relatively recent. As you saw at the beginning slide, it was uh, June, 2019. So it is something that, um, they're saying, um, it's, it's, it's something that is, that's, uh, out there. So something to look at and to consider as we know what time we are, that we are living near the end of time and those systems are, are becoming in place. And so seeing how these things develop is something to be on the watch for. Amen. Um, let's close out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because we know that uh, you have given us promises in your word that you're coming soon. And we continue to see the evidence of it's your fulfillment that you are coming soon. We see the signs around us um, from the uh, from the crime, uh, from the uh, natural disasters, from um, the corruption. Uh, we see, Lord, that you have given us the signs that you've mentioned in Matthew 24 and in um, First Thess in Timothy, first that talks about these things that shall happen in the last days. And so, we, Lord, we know that we are living in the last days, and we continue to watch for signs that continue to reveal your soon coming. And Lord, as we see them coming into fruition, we ask, Lord, that you continue to teach us and help us to be able to stand faithful to you and to um, have your Holy Spirit poured out upon us, not rejecting your Holy Spirit and being um, disobedient to your word, but being obedient to your word and having you fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can be recipients of the blessing that you have promised. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you continue to um, join us on Sabbath, uh, this Sabbath for the uh, Sabbath School Bible Study, and that begins around 1030. And then following that, we have the Divine Worship Hour. And then um, for next week, I think that we may be... Um, <laughs> I think we'll have to give you the update for next week's Hour of Power. Um, and until uh, Sabbath service, may God continue to bless you all. Amen. <laughs>